Break Fix's History of Motorsports series is brought to you in part by the International Motor Racing Research Center, as well as the Society of Automotive Historians, the Watkins Glen Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Argetsinger family. Harry Miller, The Man and the Cars, by Gordon Elliott White. Mr. White is a retired newspaper correspondent who covered Washington, D.C., Europe, and the Far East for the Chicago American and other newspapers for 34 years. After he retired from newspaper work, he became the Smithsonian Institution's auto racing advisor, following a sport he has enjoyed since 1939. He since has written seven books on the history of American open-wheel racing, including the history of Fred Offenhauser and the Offenhauser Racing Engine. He has served as the unofficial historian of the Harry A. Miller Club and as curator and archivist of more than 12,000 drawings, tracings, and blueprints of Miller's cars and engines, as well as thousands of documents covering the history of American racing since the early 20th century. His presentation will address Harry Miller and Miller's impression on American racing, as well as how aficionados rediscovered him after he had been all but forgotten and over the past 40 years have unearthed and restored many of his cars. All right, folks, next up we have Harry Miller, The Man in the Cars by Gordon Elliott White. Thank you, Bob, and and good, good morning. It's nice to be back in Watkins Glen. I first visited here in 1951 and 1952 when they were running the races on the streets of Watkins Glen. And as I recall, they had the Queen Catherine's Cup, and I was just told they also had the Seneca Cup, and then the Grand Prix was the Peace de Resistance. I was a freshman at Cornell in 1951 and a race fan, which led me to come over here to, to watch the races. While I was at Cornell, I ran a few rallies with my hot rod, one of which I actually won to the amazement of my mostly sports car competitors. My first photos are, are Harry Miller, one with his uh, 91 cubic inch straight eight engine, supercharged, and the second with a supercharger. My subject today is Harry Miller and his legacy. Miller built both racing cars and engines, and his engine designs dominated American racing for nearly 60 years. Later, they were known as Offenhauser engines, but they were based on Miller's design and general engine architecture. They would have lasted longer at Indianapolis if the supercharger boost pressures had not been limited to protect the competing 4 and Ford engines, which couldn't take as much boost as the Offie. Griffith Borgeson has described Miller as quite simply the greatest creative figure in the history of the American racing car. Harry was born in Menominee, Wisconsin, son of German immigrants. He had very little formal schooling. Menominee was a lumber town, and he learned mechanical trades on steam engines and other heavy equipment in the lumber mills. He left Wisconsin to seek his fortune in Los Los Angeles, working in a bicycle shop. He took correspondence courses in various mechanical subjects, which was the only technical training he ever had. At one point, he worked as a foundry foreman where he learned the art of casting, which became very important in his life later on. In 1960, he went to work for the Oldsmobile Company and rode as a mechanic on that year's Oldsmobile entry into Vanderbilt Cup races on Long Island. Olds didn't do very well in the Vanderbilt Cup, and Harry returned to Los Angeles, eventually setting up a shop to produce carburetors of his own design patented several carburetor designs, and they were initially used as aftermarket carburetors on passenger cars. The Miller carburetor, however, turned out to be quite successful for racing cars, led Miller to do custom work for many of the racers. The Miller shop became the winter headquarters for many of the racing people, and he had customers including Barney Oldfield, Bob Berman, and Dario Resta, which at that time were the top people in American racing. As Miller built racing equipment, his design work followed the empirical habit of Americans, learning by experiment, much as had Thomas Edison, who designed the light bulb by trying out, I think, 200 different things for his filament, and Henry Ford, neither of whom had university educations. By comparison, in Europe at the time, trained engineers led most of the uh, technical development and uneducated race drivers, Jules Go, George Below, and Paolo Cucarelli would were called Les Charlatans when they designed the first overhead cam engine for Peugeot, much to the disgust of the trained engineers that worked for Peugeot. Go tro- drove an overhead cam Peugeot to win at Indianapolis in 1913. Bob Berman bought it 
blew the engine in a race at San Diego, and took the remains to Harry Miller to have it rebuilt. Eddie Rickenbacker also, in his terms, unloaded his broken-down Peugeot on Miller, calling it the major mistake of my racing career because he made a tremendous car out of it. Miller, in the process of rebuilding the Peugeots, educated himself in the best European engine practices. The first complete car that Miller built was called the Golden Submarine. It carried one of the engines that he had designed. The engine was also perhaps to go into an aircraft. And Miller hoped to sell those engines either for racing or airplanes. In 1916, Barney Oldfield had Miller build this radical enclosed racing car powered by that engine. As I say, it was painted in gold lacquer and became known as the Golden Submarine. Oldfield drove it in a number of races. It was not immensely successful, but it won a few races. At Springfield, Illinois, he crashed and the car caught fire. And so after that, Barney cut off the rest of the body so he wouldn't be trapped in it. From the Golden Submarine, Miller went on to build a few more experimental racing cars, the best of them being the TNT, after Leo Goosen, who was a trained engineer and draftsman who came from Buick, joined his staff. Goosen supplied the technical knowledge of a trained engineer that Miller lacked, and he would go on to become the preeminent race engine designer in North America. Somewhat earlier, Miller had hired Fred Offenheiser as a machinist. Offenheiser had been trained in the uh, railroad shops, and at the time, the railroad shops are what NASA became. It was the highest level of technical work and design in the country. From the Golden Submarine, Miller went on to build a more, few more experimental race cars. In 1920, four Miller engine cars were entered at Indianapolis, but none of them qualified. During the following year, Miller and driver Tommy Milton helped design a straight engine of 183 cubic inches that embodied much of the engine architecture that remained through the life of Miller and Offenheiser engines. Ira Vale qualified one of these 183s in India in 1921 and finished 10th. In 1922, Jimmy Murphy qualified with a Miller engine and won the race. In 1923, Miller competed in several European Grand Prix. They finished well, although they didn't win a race. This next picture is of a front drive 91 cubic inch Miller car, and the man in the background with the, the bowler hat is Umbrella Mike Boyle. Boyle was a business agent for the Chicago Electrical Union as his day job, and you wonder how he made enough money out of being the business agent to afford race cars, but that was Chicago. Through the rest of the Roaring Twenties, Miller engine cars would win five of eight races at Indianapolis, even as engine sizes were reduced first to 122 inches and then to 91 inches. Supercharging was used to increase the horsepower even while engine displacements were reduced. This is Ralph Hepburn in a front drive Miller 91. This is a car I will mention again later on. At the same time, Miller was also producing a four-cylinder engine of 151 inches for racing boats. Eventually, a slightly larger four was produced for dirt track cars that are now known as sprint cars. Miller engines were the top of the line of speedboat racing in the 1920s, and eventually, band leader Guy Lombardo would win the Gold Cup in a uh, Miller engine speedboat, which started out named My Sin, and he named it Tempo Fourth. By 1929, Miller was at the top of the heap in racing, but his and the Duesenberg brothers' tiny 91 cubic inch engines had gotten a long way from the original Indianapolis racing, which was largely a stock car, so the fenders taken off. This is a Miller 91 piston, supercharged straight eight. Actually, this piston is out of one of Leon Dure's uh, 1928 front drive Millers. I got it uh, when the Smithsonian took one of Dury's cars in 1993, and it had been re restored by Bob Rubin, the donor. The change that Rickenbacker pushed through the AAA contest board led to what was called the junk formula. They banned superchargers and allowed stock block engines 366 cubic inches, quite a bit more than any of the Miller engines really were ever built. Miller engines continued to win at Indianapolis nonetheless. In the early 1930s, Harry designed a series of innovative chassis powered by larger 230 cubic inch engines, unsupercharged in accordance with the rules. But those were depression years, and he couldn't sell enough 230s to keep his business going. This picture is Shorty Cantlin in one of the 230 chassis with a 16-cylinder engine, Miller engine in it. However, Harry got into the uh, custom passenger car business, 
which uh, he couldn't sell en enough of them to keep his business going either. The next photo is of the engine, which I, I think this is a pretty impressive V16 Miller engine, which later went into a, a race car. When Miller went bankrupt, he left Los Angeles forever, and although he was broke, he was still considered a genius by people who wanted uh, race cars. This is a, a Miller Ford. Preston Tucker was able to talk Henry Ford into having Miller built a series of 10 race cars, very advanced race cars, t to carry the, the new Ford V8 engine. Unfortunately, they started building them in March for a race in May, and they were not able to test them adequately. While they had some good drivers, Ted Horn was on, four were able to qualify, but all of them fell out of the race in 35, largely because of an inherent problem with the steering gear, which, of course, much discouraged uh, Henry Ford, and he sequestered the cars for, for a while. Eventually, they got out and were used in other ways. The unsuccessful passion cars probably put the nail in the coffin of Miller's business. And at the bankruptcy auction, Miller's shop foreman, Fred Offenheiser, bought most of the machinery and patterns and set up his own shop to manufacture both parts and complete engines, eventually changing their name from Miller to Offenheiser, although they were, of course, based on Miller designs. And next, Gulf Oil hired Harry to build them a series of race cars. Unfortunately, they specified that they run on Gulf pump gasoline, which was not a very good idea because other people were running race cars, particularly in Indianapolis, with uh, racing fuel, which made a lot more power. Harry didn't have Fred or Leo to calm some of his flights of fancy. This car, you will see, has a radiator made out of chrome-plated tubing. That was a mistake. It overheated immediately, and he had to replace it with uh, rather ugly conventional radiators. In any event, they took these cars to Indianapolis, but they had problems of all sorts getting them qualified. The fuel tanks were at the bottom of the frame there. Mark Dees thinks they were an aerodynamic item. I'm not sure about that, but they were certainly a hazard because when they, a couple of them crashed, and the next picture is of one that crashed, ruptured the fuel tank, the car burned up, and killed the driver, who was George Bailey. As World War II approached, Miller moved to Detroit and designed both aircraft and marine engines for the military. Preston Tucker lured him into designing an engine for both an armored car and a fighter plane. But Harry didn't have the engineering skill or knowledge to meet the Air Corps requirements for a military engine. He was still designing empirically by trial and error. That didn't suit the uh, military. Harry was then living in Detroit, and he died in Detroit in poverty in 1943. Now, this is Fred Offenhaus, who had taken over producing Miller engines. In the early 1930s, midgets had become a, a real force in racing, but they were generally powered by junk engines, motorcycle engines, and to move the <laughs> show along, several people decided they needed a, a professional racing engine. Offenhauser had Leo Goosen essentially cut a Miller 183 in half to produce a 97 cubic inch midget engine. It was an immediate success. Until the late 70s, they put, Offenhauser and, uh, had produced 450 of those engines. We'll note some of the successes that the Offenhauser engines had. 1959 USAC, which replaced 3A as the dominant sanctioning body in American racing, held a series of Formula Libre races, pitting midgets against sports cars. And the most famous of these held on the road course at Lime Rock, Connecticut. Roger Ward and an Offenhauser-powered Curtis defeated the cream of the world's sports cars. This is Ward and Ken, the Ken Bren midget about to pass George Constantine in an Aston Martin DBR2. Shocked the sports car world that a midget could, could defeat them. And I had a little success with an offy midget. This is my car at Bonneville, 1989, where I set a midget record of 156.902, and then I set a, an FIA two-liter unblown record of 153,198. Probably the only car to set a speed record after winning top prizes in an antique show car. The Offenhauser Indy engines, I say, were penalized by not being able to run as much boost as they would have liked. This is uh, Mark Alderson in the last Offie powered car to be entered at Indy. He was in line for a qualification run when time ran out, and that was the end of, of the Offenhauser engines at in Indianapolis. This, by comparison, is an Indy 
uh, off the inch and 270 cubic inch. As you can see, it's somewhat larger <laughs> than Miller's 91. The first of the Offenheiser built Miller engines was a 255 cubic inch produced in 1935 to Kelly Patello, who won the Indy 500 with it that year, putting the Offenheiser or off the engine at the top of the list for serious Indy competitors. Although Leo Goosen said to his dying day that the engine was really a Miller, of the following 37 Indy races, the engine is known as Offenheiser 128. In fact, for five years in Indianapolis, all of the qualifying cars were off powered. In 1946, Fred Offenheiser sold the engine business to Lou Meyer and Dale Drake, who continued it under the Offenheiser name. As I said, the Offley was displaced in Indianapolis by the Ford Camp Ford engine, but it came back in the 1970s with turbocharging to win five more 500s. The last Offley qualify came in 1980. This is uh, a turbo Offley owned by Rolla Volstadt. As I say, it was in line to qualify, but didn't make it. 270, 255, and later turbocharged Offleys dominated championship racing for many years. And the smaller midget engine simply overwhelmed midget racing. After World War II, an off the engine and a Curtis chassis was so dominant, it was an event if any other car or engine won a race. The 220 sprint car engine was the class on the half-mile tracks as well, though because it cost more than the uh, modified Model A engines and other passenger car engines, it was in a minority. In 1957, the small block Chevy, with many more cubic inches, became competitive. In the last year, an off he won the sprint car championship was 1959. As I said, Miller died in Detroit in 1943, almost forgotten. After the war, a few people remembered him or that the dominant Offenheiser engine had become life as a Miller. It was not until a dozen years after Miller's death that Griffith Borgerson, editor of Sports Car Illustrated magazine, began to write about Miller and his engines, and people began to appreciate Harry Miller. Leon Dore had taken his two Miller front drive cars to France in 1929 after the last Indianapolis race before they were outlawed by the rules change. He sold them to Bugatti. They remained in France during World War II. Borgeson discovered them there in 1959 and brought them back to the United States. One went to the Indianapolis Speedway Museum. By 1990, the newspaper I was working for had lost half its circulation and couldn't afford me in Washington. So I took early retirement, went to the Smithsonian as their auto racing advisor. This is a photo of me in the Dura car at Bridgehampton when I was trying to persuade Bob Rubin to donate to the Smithsonian, which he did in 1993. Borgeson's writing about Miller generated a movement among a group of car collectors to find surviving Millers and restore them. In the early 1990s, Mark Dees of Moore Park, California, Chuck Davis of Chicago, Dave Eline of Milwaukee, and Bob Sutherland of Colorado organized the Harry A. Miller Club, which each July hosts a meet at the mile track in Milwaukee, where restored Millers and other front-engine champ cars can be exercised at speed. This is a photo of the uh, field at Milwaukee with mostly Miller cars and engines. Many of Miller's drawings and blueprints have survived. For 25 years, I've maintained an archive of more than 12,000 such drawings, originals of which are now at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. By now, there are more Millers, many put together out of parts, than Harry built. The event at Milwaukee and shows such as Pebble Beach, Middle Island, and Hershey pay appropriate honor to Harry Arminius Miller, a giant in American racing. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Gordon White? Gordon, you and I have worked together for a long time. I'm interested to just comment. There are a couple of things that remain, you might say, in question that I'd, I'd like to bring up. But the, the first is that actually the design for the double overhead cam sh shaft engine, the uh, 183, was a result of the frustration of Tommy Milton with uh, getting Duesenberg single overhead cam engines that he didn't think were up to level. But he did steal... <laughs> the uh, specifications of the Duesenberg engines and brought them to Miller, which uh, produced uh, the original double over cam uh, Miller, which then he began to win races with a car called the Durant Special. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, as I mentioned in my lecture, Jimmy Murphy and Harry Hartz 
got a hold of engines, and eventually then uh, Cliff Durant built, a, I think, a field of five cars that were entered. I'm interested, and I, I don't know if you've ever investigated this, but Jim O'Keefe and I uh, were working hard on this uh, question, and, and we believe actually that the first true full Miller racing car was called the Pan American, built prior to the uh, Golden Submarine. It's never been fully accredited as such, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you have any comment on that. The final comment is just that, as been said, there is really a real cult of Miller lovers, me being one, although I don't own one. Miller's achievements, at least prior to losing his company, were a result of competition that was from both Louis Chevrolet and Fred and Olga Duesenberg, who introduced supercharging at uh, the Indianapolis 500 and others. It's a fascinating era of American development in which tires, fuels, and metals, lubricants, all of these things were, in essence, developed in the board track era, largely by Harry Miller and the Duesenbergs and, and, uh, and Louis Chevrolet. But the comment is, is rather too long, except to say that I'd be interested to know if you've investigated the Pan American as a car and whether or not, indeed, it was the first true full car built by Miller. From what I know, that's a, an unfounded rumor that might possibly be true. It's clear that Miller took advice from uh, Milton and other drivers and car owners. He didn't do a lot of on-track testing, a little. We have a few photos. Most of the testing was done in races, and if things didn't work, they came back to Harry and said, you got to fix this, you got to fix that. And that continued through Offenheiser, Meyer, and Drake, and Drake Engineering. But I, I'm not really were a definite knowledge on the uh, Pan American. When did Henry, or did he, have any interest in aerodynamics and the streamlining of his cars? You could possibly say the Gold Submarine was an experiment in aerodynamics. It was certainly more aerodynamic than contemporary race cars at that point. It did not prove to be a world beater. As we saw, Barney Oldfield likely to be trapped in a closed car and took it off. Side fuel pods on the uh, Gulf Miller cars, if you look at them carefully. Side pods there could be seen as an airfoil. It was thought that perhaps Miller was designed then to give down for us. That's as much as I'm aware of serious aerodynamics. Of course, the front drive cars, without a drive shaft under the driver, allowed them to sit lower, and they had less frontal area, so that was an aerodynamic advance right there. Gordon, one last gentleman in the back asked, has any of the tooling survived, Offenhauser or Miller, what have you? Not that I'm aware of. I've got photos of some of the Miller machine. Offenhauser bought some at the bankruptcy auction in 33. He's also said to have taken some out of the back door before the auction. Meyer and Drake undoubtedly got some when they bought out Fred Offenhauser. I knew John Drake, talked to him. I don't think anything had survived from Miller's shop. His machinery was run at first by overhead shafts, as machine shops were run in those days. Eventually, they electrified some of the machinery. Machinery from the late 20s was probably not really useful by the time that John Drake went out of business. Some of the patterns have survived. Bob McConnell has a number of patterns. Kendall Merritt has a number of patterns. Dean Butler had quite a few, and he sold them to somebody in Troy, Michigan. Unfortunately, during the Meyer and Drake years, patterns that were clearly obsolete were thrown away, and some of them were burned up. A few people rescued some of those obsolete patterns. So I never have survived. So if you really want to cast your own Miller 255 block, you can do it. Gordon, thank you again. Thanks very much. This episode is brought to you in part by the International Motor Racing Research Center. Its charter is to collect, share, and preserve the history of motorsports, spanning continents, eras, and race series. The center's collection embodies the speed, drama, and camaraderie of amateur and professional motor racing throughout the world. The center welcomes serious researchers and casual fans alike to share stories of race drivers, race series, and race cars captured on their shelves and walls and brought to life through a regular calendar of public lectures and special events. To learn more about the center, visit www.racingarchives.org.
This episode is also brought to you by the Society of Automotive Historians. They encourage research into any aspect of automotive history. The SAH actively supports the compilation and preservation of papers, organizational records, print ephemera and images to safeguard, as well as to broaden and deepen the understanding of motorized, wheeled land transportation through the modern age and into the future. For more information about the SAH, visit www.autohistory.org. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, gummy bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible. Thank <laughs> you.